fast, it's deliberate, uh, because I don't expect you necessarily to take all these ideas. The idea is not to give you a completely neat story. It's to give you actually a feel, the space of what evidence based management actually is, what evidence based HR is in particular, what it is, why do you need it, and how we do it. How many of you have heard before this session of evidence based anything? What have you heard of evidence based? Decision making, evidence based management. You've actually heard of this before this. Wow, okay, good, good. I'm, apparently, I'm according to some survey, I'm the uh, 14th most influential thinker in the UK in HR. I feel really sorry for everyone else. <laughs> if I'm up there, number 14, I said it needs to be really desperate. Anyway, so yeah, evidence based is something I've heard, also, you may have heard in connection with medicine. So, as an idea, it's been around for a long time. And it's basically a very simple concept, and this is it. The practitioners in any field make decisions, they make choices, judgments. Those decisions are based on evidence or information of various kinds. And the idea is that only using a little evidence, or evidence that isn't very valid, or reliable, or relevant, is unlikely to lead to worse decisions than if you use more and more valid evidence. Now, I'm guessing most of you do buy that. Yeah, kind of, it sort of feels like common sense. And one thing I want to talk about is if this feels so much like common sense, why don't we do it? Because I don't think we do, as managers, as academics, as people. So why don't we do that? We'll come up in a minute. So what happens in HR? This is just sort of a view that decisions of course are based on evidence. Managers, HR, people always use evidence. But the problem is that training and continuing professional development, the HR practitioners doesn't really support the use of evidence, I would argue very much. Uh, HR research doesn't influence research, uh, practice very much, probably most of our academic research. Internal HR data, which was all arguably maybe low quality, very limited, hard to understand, and actually very poorly analysed. My look into a bit about how big organisations use their internal data is not, it's okay, but they're not really making much use of it, or the best use of it, I think. There's also, I think, one key thing is there's few incentives for HR to use research and evaluations in general of HR and other management practices are rare. So we've kind of got a bit of a problem that we all agree with that common sense, but it doesn't seem to happen. Who thinks there's a problem? Well, some academics do. You've probably heard Denise Rousseau, Jeff Pfeffer, Sarah Ryans. They think it's a problem. Some practitioners do, and some commentators. Michael Skopinka, writing in the Financial Times a couple of years ago, talked in particular about one source of evidence, which is academic evidence and academic research, and basically arguing that business schools are ignored by business. So if you're comparing it to law schools or medical schools, there's this wealth of information that may or may not be relevant to businesses that is just not used. It's just there, and it's not kind of developed very much. So a few people think it's a problem. Do you know what kind of field, can you guess what field this is describing? I'll give you a clue. It's about 20 years ago. This is the way in which this particular field of practice, it's not HR, but it could be. Uh, this is the field of practice. Can you guess what it's describing? Not management, not HR, what do you reckon? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you see, you've heard of a lot of this stuff, haven't you? I can tell. Yeah, it's medicine, exactly. So this is a view of what medicine was like 20 years ago. It, the research is questionable, fads and fashions driving, and even that practices that medical practitioners do actually do more harm than good. So it's describing medicine 20 years ago. It's still quite the case today. There's still, I want to say medicine is particularly evidence-based. It's trying. And it started really in 91, where the British Medical Journal produced two editorials, one saying that only 15 to 20% of all medical interventions are supported by solid medical evidence. I wonder what the percentage is in HR. I'm not going to, you know, just out of interest to think about that a bit. Many practices do harm and good, and it started what in fact was an evidence-based practice movement in medicine, and now it's in many fields. So education, policing, social care, and most recently management. So policing is a very good example. I've done some work with uh, New Scotland Yard around this. And what is interesting about what police do, I don't mean criminal evidence, I mean evidence around things like if there is an incident of domestic violence, what is the evidence about what police should do to maybe stop that escalating? or stop it reoccurring? Should they arrest people? Should they go around immediately? Should they go around three times? What do we know about that? And that started to take root in policing, things like hotspot policing as well. So it's in many, many fields, but it is not yet in management or HR very much. It's starting to happen a bit. So the challenge is that all practitioners always use evidence, as I say, that the main problem is that the nature, quantity, and quality of that evidence is often not the best. Organisations copy what other organisations do. They use common sense, which is usually wrong. They use intuition, experience, which can be wrong. Uh, 
Also, one of the challenges is how can practitioners start using more and more valid evidence in their work? That's the real challenge. Why doesn't it happen? What is evidence-based management? This is a recent definition. Uh, it's quite a widely kind of a used one, I suppose, quite general. So it's about making decisions through the conscientious, which means you try and you're diligent, explicit, which means you share, you write down, you codify that evidence, and judicious, which means you make a judgment about the relevance and quality of that evidence. So it's collecting evidence in those three ways, and it's collecting evidence from four sources. So the first is, is your own expertise and judgment. You have to use your own expertise. You, evidence doesn't speak for itself, other kinds of evidence. But you have to critically appraise it as well. It might, might be good, it might be bad. It also uses evidence from the local context, which might be internal data, HR data in this context. A critical evaluation of the best research evidence that's what do we know in peer-reviewed academic journals about this phenomenon we're interested in, and also the perspectives of people who might be affected. And for those people who like Venn diagrams, the idea is that the decision takes place at the intersection of those four different areas of evidence or information. So if you were, say, in a situation where you were managing high absence or you thought you had a problem with absence, this is just, for example, what, the, what this thinking might f uh, involve. Firstly, you'd look at your own expertise and judgment. Have I seen this before? What do I think is going on? You know, we all have our own theories about absence. They might be great, they might be terrible. But what are they? Make them explicit, critically evaluate them. The second is evidence from local context. What is the absence rate? What forms of absence? What data do I have internally? The third is the best available research evidence. What do we know from published evidence and research that tells us what the main causes of absence are? What does that evidence tell us about the main solutions or interventions that can reduce absence? And the fourth one is the perspective of people who might be affected. So how do employees feel about these interventions? How maybe do the managers feel they're going to implement those interventions for you? How do they feel about it? So it really is bringing these different forms of evidence together to bear on the question. These are some general misconceptions about evidence-based practice. Uh, often people think it just means you use quantitative so-called scientific evidence. It doesn't mean that at all. Evidence just means information. And I often use a court of law, a legal analogy. In a, in a court of law, anything can count as evidence. It can be witness statement, it can be CCTV, it can be forensic stuff, it can be anything. So it doesn't really matter what it is. The key thing is that it's critically appraised for its quality and its relevance. Also, people think often practitioners don't like evidence-based practice in every field because they feel I can't use my experience. And I hope I've nailed that on the head. It, you do use your experience. You have to use your experience. That is another source of information. The other thing people get sometimes a bit confused about is they think evidence can prove things. Evidence can't prove anything. Proof is kind of a mathematical or logic thing. You know, it's abstract. You can't, it's just evidence. It's just data. It's just information. You can't prove anything with it. It gives you likelihoods or probabilities. Similarly, evidence doesn't tell you the truth. I mean, truth is a spiritual, religious, it's nothing to do with bits of information. So it's not about truth. It's not about proving things. People also are very excited, and HR is incredibly guilty of this, uh, of new, exciting breakthrough studies. People feel that the new thing, the latest thing, is going to be the best. No, I individual studies, new studies, almost always never, ever matter. Because it's the body of evidence that's important, not one or two or three studies. It doesn't matter. They may show there's something going on, but it's actually the body of work that counts. Also, people feel that collecting evidence gives you the answer. Evidence rarely gives you the answer. And this is why it can be quite disappointing. You spend a lot of time doing this. You put it all together and you go, oh my God, it still hasn't given us the answer. We failed. No, you've actually succeeded because you're still going to make a much better decision because you're much better informed. Also, people feel that doing uh, evidence-based practice means you have to just do what the research evidence tells you. No, of course you don't because it's just one source of evidence. You don't do what it tells you. You have to apply it in your context. People also feel if you don't have the evidence, you can't do anything. Like you can't get out of bed unless you've got a randomized control trial or some big data, you know, you can't do it. Of course it doesn't mean that. You still do things, but you do them knowing you don't know, or you're guessing, or it's a hunch, because you've decided what the evidence is. People also feel experts, consultants, experts, and management school professors, they know all the evidence, so you just need to ask them. No, they don't. Experts are biased, they're limited, they, they make stuff up because it suits them, they are human. Experts cannot tell you about evidence. They can tell you their opinion. They can tell you their opinion of the evidence. Experts can help you understand evidence, 
but they are not repositories of evidence. Experts have not memorized every single piece of research in the universe and can splurge it out at a moment's notice. That's not what experts do. So you cannot trust experts in this context for this purpose, in general, actually. Anyway, um, one of the interesting things is it's really not weird to use evidence in everyday life. If you look at these questions, which you may ask yourself from time to time, they're everyday kind of questions. And what's interesting is when it comes to our own lives, I think we use evidence a lot. So we might go to something like IMDb or the other site, Rotten Tomatoes. If you've got a chance to watch one film this weekend, you haven't seen one for months, you really want to go and see, how are you going to find out? You're going to go and get some information. IMDb. You may, if you're choosing a hotel, go on to TripAdvisor. You may have views about how reliable or otherwise TripAdvisor is. But when you look at it and say, can I trust this? You're doing critical appraisal. Why is this really bad Italian restaurant in Bath, number one in Bath, and why has it got 3,000 reviews and the next restaurant's only got 150? Hmm, maybe something's going on. Yes, it is, if you ever go to that restaurant. I can tell you later where it is if you want. But, you know, something weird is going on, so you make a judgment about it. Also, I'm sure all you're familiar, if you're kind of middle class and neurotic about buying consumer goods, you've all probably been on Witch or Buy Witch magazine. And you'll see that what you're doing here, I mean, you've really got to light washing to spend £939 on a washing machine. Or you just have to do a lot or whatever. But what you do, probably like I do, is you look at the price, you look at the score, and you kind of go down, you're doing a simultaneous equation in your head to you hit this kind of sweet spot where we're actually, come on, let's go for hot point. Or you may say, you know, I don't like hot point, that's common. I like a Bosch, because I'm a Bosch kind of person. So again, you're using information evidence to make decisions. So it's not weird to use evidence, but what seems to be the case is that professionals in many fields, including HR practitioners, in my view, they don't, and they don't because other things drive decisions. Okay, ideally, going back to the beginning, common sense, yes, of course we should use them, but that is not often what drives decisions. Other things do. So what are those other things? I'd like just to read this for a second. Now, obviously, you know this is a trick question, don't you? So I'm not going to ask you to give the answer. But what is the answer you want to give, even though you know it's not the right answer? Who, who for example, is thinking, you know, 10p? Yeah, that's what you want to say, 10p. Does anyone have another answer that isn't 10p? Yeah. 5p, yeah, it's 5p, okay? And it's five, well, I won't go into, into why, but there's a framing effect here that makes you want to say 10p. And this is an example of cognitive bias or heuristic being studied a lot by psychologists that mean that even when presented with really simple information, the way it's framed will really drive the answer we give. So you can give this question, not in this context, to all kinds of people, you know, even, for God's sake, Harvard MBA students, you know, whatever, and most people, 60-70%, give the answer 10p. The answer is 5p. If you want to know why, ask me at the end. But it, it is 5p. Uh, even though the first time I actually heard this, I kept walking out, I think it's got to be 10p. It's got to be 10p. It's obviously 10p. It isn't 10p, it's 5p. This is another one. So what's the answer you want to give? 30 set, what is it, sorry? Yeah, you want to say 24, but the correct answer is, yeah, the correct answer is 47. Okay? It, these are just there's tons of these examples. And what they are, examples of biases, I'm not going to go into all of these, but examples might be a, a mere exposure effect. You like things you become more familiar with. This is the basis of marketing. Things that you see a lot, you sort of like more for no other reason you've seen them more. Yeah? Absolute biased kind of decision making. Or... Uh, you, people tend to prefer avoiding losing things and acquiring things. Anchoring effects. You overemphasize certain pieces of information. So restaurants, then their wine lists, they often put very expensive bottles of wine at the, at the bottom of it, not because anyone's going to buy those, but because what people tend to do is go, I don't want to be a cheapskate, so I'm not going to buy, like, the, the house wine or one of the top three. Wow, there's one for £580. I'm going to go like two-thirds or a third of the way down, and people make a judgment like that. So the anchoring of that means you're going to spend more on wine, on average, not because you're going to buy the more expensive bottle. 
Another thing is a framing effect, and these are examples of framing effect. You can present this information in a different way, and everyone just go, yeah, it's 5p. Present it like this, people want to say 10p. It's a framing effect. So you may get it, for example, when you say, uh, if you look at a ready meal, instead of it saying 85% fat-free, it might say 15% fat. If it said 15% fat, that would sound like, wow, that's a lot of fat. The 85% fat-free sounds kind of okay, but it's the same information. It's a framing thing again. And also, the most dangerous, the metacognitive bias, is the belief we don't have any of these biases. And one of the frightening things about these biases is it's nothing to do with how confident you are. You can feel incredibly confident, correct, right, everything else, but you're wrong, and you don't know. So this is one reason why everybody needs some like, evidence-based practice. But there are three reasons I think particularly affect managers and HR managers, and these are these. Fads and fashions, consultants, and power and politics. These are the things that make decisions rather than the evidence, or not as much as evidence kind of should. These are some examples of fads and fashions. I'm sure you're, you're very familiar with these. And as you know, all fads and fashions have to have a book that goes with them, often with like a nice plate on the front, normally something to do with Harvard Business Review or something. And also all these books have endorsements on them from the other people who've written the fad books, if you've noticed. So yeah, little kind of all fads, fads, fads. There's lots of research into fads now, looking at when they appear and when they disappear. This is just an example of quality circles. This is some time ago, but looking at when they come and they go. And this is quite typical of these, these fads. They appear, everybody gets very excited, then they go away again. This is uh, looking at total quality again, and this person here, they've analysed the titles of popular business articles, in this case for total quality. So when it's in its ascendancy, you get total quality, wave of the future. It's radical. The promise of re-engineering. Maturity, maybe, maybe it's not quite so good as we thought, and maybe, oh dear, it could be a fad, maybe it's not great. Then decline, 10 reasons why TQM doesn't work, the mystique, the mistakes, the hocus pocus, why TQM fails. And you see this in HR all the time, this kind of cycle of fads going on. What's the problem with it? Well, the main problem is a lack of any solid intellectual foundation. Uh, implicit in each fad is a cause effect statement. You do this, and this will happen. Do that that will happen, it's going to be great. Um, and it's rarely made explicit and never supported properly by evidence. Uh, management needs to involve a sound body of knowledge and clear language so that it assists members of the profession to reason cogently. Fadism is the enemy. So what they're, this is Donaldson and Hilmer, what they're saying is that fads get in the way of, of our ability to think through problems because they present these attractive things we want to grab hold of and think will help us in some way. How to spot a fad rather often buzzy and exciting. Uh, the massive claims with no good quality supporting evidence usually. Uh, they involve management gurus and academic superstars. They're always presented as it's all good, there's no downsides. Presented as universal panacea will fix everything forever for everyone. That's how they're presented usually. Also, there's lots of unverifiable anecdotes and success stories, usually from big companies like you know, Google. You know, if Google do it, it must be great, right? Uh, and also, the, the success of the company is attributed to the fad with often no evidence. Okay, here's a successful company, they do X, therefore X must have made them successful, with no support. Also, they often involve new words which don't actually describe anything new, things like analytics, which as far as I can just means analysis, big data, which is pretty much the same as data, unless you've got five billion trillion data points, it's no different. Talent is people, human, so these are ways of spotting, is this actually anything new or is it a fad? These are some criteria. So a related concept is a quick fix, and we're often used to those as practitioners in many fields. They focus on style, they're not evaluated, they're not as quick as you'd hope. They're often not as effective as we, because you have to do another quick fix to do it, but they can be career enhancing. Often what people are rewarded for in organizations is getting stuff done, not doing what works, because people don't evaluate, so you never find out. But what you do find out is that people can do things and make things happen. Um, I want you to think of an example of this, and it seems to be a very human thing to do this. So in your kitchen, you've probably got a cupboard, I'm guessing, and in that cupboard, I put it to you, there's equipment, kitchen equipment, that you don't really use. But it could be quite expensive, and you really thought you were going to use it, but it's just sort of gathering dust in the cupboard. What is in that kitchen cupboard? Come on, come clean. What's in it? The waffle maker. The waffle maker. Very good example, yeah, yeah. Anything else? What else is in that cupboard? Raclette machine. Yeah, you're going to have so much fun with that raclette. It didn't quite work out. Yeah, what else? Juicer, anybody? Juicer? Food processor? Yeah, all this kind of stuff like this. We buy it because we imagine it's going to help us with some undefined 
sort of problem. And then we buy it, we use it. Like this pasta make, it turns out to be a pain in the ass to use. It's, the pasta's not that much better than good quality dry pasta, so it goes in the cupboard and eventually ends up in a local charity shop. And you can see this stuff in charity shops. So this is a sort of related concept. We buy stuff because we think it's going to help us. This is a field which many people have issues with, problems with, particularly in the developed West, is weight. And you find lots of quick fixes and fads and fashions in weight. And you find these same things in HR management, similar things. This is drinking coffee and losing weight, for example, so you can drink this special coffee and lose weight. This is a, 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 a website that actually rates diet pills. The idea you can just take a diet pill and you can get sort of thin. It gives them points, and they often contain ingredients that always seem to be from chili in rainforests. Uh, never just a boring ingredient from somewhere in Suffolk, you know, or Scotland. It has to be from somewhere near a rainforest. Otherwise, obviously, it's not going to work, is it? Because it's got to be exotic kind of thing. Um, and, of course, yeah, we see there's another example, cookie diet. You know, the diet industry thrives on selling quick fixes and fads. And in general, for most people, most of the time, the way you lose or control weight is you expend more calories than you take in. And that is kind of it. Not for everyone, but for most people. Losing weight, maintaining weight is hard. It's boring. It takes a lot of time. You have to think about it. It's effortful. I think that's what management is. But we don't want to do that. We want fun, exciting new things that will fix things quickly. And I don't think a lot of management or losing weight is like that. Here's another seven-day belly blast diet. You can eat all these things that kill you and apparently it won't. And again, you know, this Josh is being seen on these TV stations, so he must be good, right? There you go. And when you look at these before and after pictures, I think if you take, for example, I know Gail, who slashed 53 pounds of fat, I think also often we're looking at our own organizations and seeing something a bit like Gail on the left and thinking, well, it would be better if we like Gail on the right. And to get there, we know in our hearts it's a lot of work and it'll take a long time and it'll be quite boring. So why do that when we can take a pill or have a cookie instead? So I think it's a similar, what I'm saying is it's a human thing to want to follow these things. So they appear to develop a lot of fat. They're simple, they're shiny, they're going to make everything okay. They help contain anxieties. And from people who's more psychological uh, angle on this, people think that fads and fashions help because they contain anxiety. Most senior managers don't ultimately really know what's going on. Why should they? They don't know how to fix things and they've got some ideas, but they're given this massive responsibility. A way to contain and control that anxiety is them to latch on to what seems like a great idea that everyone else is doing. It helps kind of contain that. Evidence-based management is causing not much of a fad because actually if you do evidence-based practice and evidence-based HR, it may increase your anxiety, not reduce it. It may make you realize how little you know. It may make you feel you've got to, got to take a long time to do this stuff. It won't be quick, which is another reason why it's not very popular. Just to prove I'm not beyond this, this any of you ever had a banana guard? And no one's had a banana guard. You're, you're losing out, man. So some years ago, I bought a banana guard. And in fact, I bought several because I thought, oh, yeah, that's good, banana. I can put banana in my bag. It won't get crushed. Fantastic, you know. So I bought a banana guard. And it turns out, you know, that I don't actually have a problem with crushed bananas. Uh, what I, I thought I did, and then I bought it, used it maybe once or twice, and never did again. And there's a, they say there's a couple of reasons. Like, one is I can't really, if I think about it, remember, ever opening my bag and going, oh, my God, there's a crushed banana. My life is, is, is a disaster. My day has been ruined. I don't think it's ever happened. The second thing is usually I'm never more, I would say, than about five minutes away from a banana. You know, I don't go hiking in the Lake District. I'm always, there's always bananas around. But I thought this was fixing a problem it turns out I didn't even have. So I didn't use it. And if you go on Amazon and look at the things, people who buy banana guards also buy these things. The fruit flakes is inflatable fruit case, uh, which to me suggests a general anxiety around squash fruit. It could be a childhood thing. They went to school. You know, mummy gave them some fruit and they got to school. It was all crushed and then they feel, you know, it could be that. So worried about that. They like bananas in general. And the banana-shaped stress reliever just suggests they're quite kind of anxious in some way, so they kind of need bananas. So what I'm saying is to follow fads and fashions in our personal life and as managers and as organizations and as a profession is quite natural and human, it seems, if you want to do it. And understand why it happens. We all understand the banana guard, why we buy, you know, diet. You know, but the thing is, it shouldn't happen in our professional lives as well, is what I'm arguing. There should be more of a distinction to say, whoa, this is a fad. Yeah? This is a solution in search of a problem. What is the problem? 
but the tendency to temptation to do that is really strong. Okay, so the role of consultants, and what are consultants for? They do many, many, many different things, and clearly some of what they do can absolutely be relevant to evidence-based practice, because they can provide, for example, uh, research evidence. Potentially, though most consultancies, in my experience, don't know anything about the academic research evidence, because, well, for all kinds of reasons. They can be maybe objective advisors, but they can also provide one of the sources of evidence. Consultants may have that evidence that you don't have from their experience. So that can be useful if it's critically evaluated in some way. And they can be changed. I'm not saying they're all bad, but one of the ways in which they don't help evidence-based practice is because of fads and fashions. So Pfeffer and Sutton here suggest that consultants and others who sell ideas and techniques, not advice, are always rewarded for getting work, only sometimes rewarded for doing good work, and hardly ever rewarded for if their advice actually enhances performance. And they go on to say the incentives are even more perverse than that because if a client company's problems are only partly solved, that leads to more work for the consulting firm. Now, this is, of course, not all consultants, not all consultancy, but it's the consultancies, and you know who they are, uh, who just produce and reproduce new things, new things, new techniques. And this is the way they do. So if the incentive for you as a consultancy is to get work, get more work, and keep getting work, then this is what you do. You persuade clients they need some new thing, idea, technique, approach. Let me use employee engagement as an example. And you can ask me about that afterwards if you like, or you can email me about it. You, know? you say this is the thing you need. This is the new magic bullet, employee engagement. You sell them this product. It could be a measurement instrument. It could be something that's supposed to increase it. You saturate the market until everybody's got it. Everybody's doing this now. Oh, what are you going to do? You need to come up with some new stuff they haven't got. So you devise a new thing, you sell them a relevant product, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Okay? This, I'm arguing, it's not all consultants, it's not organisations, but gets in the way of evidence-based practice. So finally, power and politics. Uh, why do people get ahead in organisations? There's a view that some of us who are interested in evidence-based management that the people at the top of organisations, this isn't for them. Evidence-based management evidence -based is not for them because they didn't get there for these reasons. Okay? They probably got there because they were good at getting things done. They probably got there because they worked really hard. They probably get them because they want to have a strong need for achievement and recognition. They're probably pretty good politically. None of those things is anything to do with evidence-based practice. And indeed, if organizations promote people and give people power in that way, they may not want to know about your evidence because they want to do their thing, because that's the way they're being rewarded. So in other words, power and politics get in the way in some organizations, including, by the way, medicine, of doing evidence-based practice. And Colvin here, Dawkin Fortune magazine, says this, and there we see the power of any big managerial idea, like fads. It may be smart, like quality, or stupid, like conglomeration. Either way, everybody's doing it. The pressure to do it, too, is immense. If it turns out to be smart, great. If it turns out to be stupid, well, you're in good company and most likely ended up no worse off than your competitors. Your company's board consists of CEOs who are probably doing it at their companies. How mad can they get? The true value of conventional management wisdom, this is fashion and fad, is not that it's wise or dumb, but that it's conventional. It makes one of the hardest jobs in the world, managing organization, a little easier. By following it, managers everywhere see a way to drag their sorry behinds through another quarter without getting fired. And isn't that really what it's all about? So again, the def it's a defensive technique, which again, gets in the way of evidence-based practice. So what are the incentives for managers to do? Well, they're not rewarded for doing what works. Speed and action valued more than accuracy. Uh, managing understanding power is more important to getting things done than using evidence. This is not all organizations everywhere, but it certainly characterizes, in my experience, a lot. So what, just to conclude then, why does HR need it? Well, because of general cognitive biases affect everyone, because fads and fashions, because consultants, advisors, and fad vendors, because of power and politics. That gets in the way of that very simple argument I presented right at the beginning. Other things make decisions, not the evidence, not the information we have. So how to become a little more evidence-based if you want to do it, and I think it is very difficult as an individual to do it. I think it's really hard to do it, but you can evaluate where you are, how evidence-based are you in your organization or as a consultancy or whatever you are? Identify the skills and resources you might need. Some organizations, I'm not sure it works, but they have something like a chief evidence officer, someone who cuts across different parts of the organization whose job it is to try and do some of this stuff. Can you get training in evidence-based HR? Can you get access to one of, those ac one of those aspects of evidence, which is peer-reviewed academic evidence? Most people can't because publishers lock it up behind paywalls. 
If you're interested, this is something I'm involved with. It's a not-for-profit uh, uh, kind of pro educational consultancy organization, the Center for Evidence-Based Management. One of the things we try and do is provide people with access to academic journals, but also training in evidence-based management. Also, I think you can view it as personal and professional development. You can ask lots of questions. I think often a good way to do evidence-based practice is just to keep asking why. You'll annoy the hell out of people, but you'll probably get to a much better answer. Uh, and also, telltale sign, if doesn't, someone doesn't want you to ask why, yeah, oh, that's enough why now, you're pretty sure there's something else going on, power politics, fads, something. Uh, develop decision aids and tools, and also develop a healthy skepticism towards these miracle cures. Accept ignorance of the limits of all forms of knowledge. One form of knowledge is not better than another. It's about bringing them together. And also, it's about values. Ultimately, if you as a practitioner or a consultant or manager, if you're not evidence-based, what are you? So evidence-based HR appears to be the most effective way, I think, of getting more evidence of different types of practice to help you critically evaluate it, to incorporate decision-making, to improve both the process and the outcome of decision-making. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>